Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our free professional development session on developing assessment checklists. And I'd like to acknowledge the Gambania people. That's where I'm coming to you from today. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land that I'm me meeting you on today and uh, pay my respects to elders past and present and extend my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining the session today. Welcome to all and very excited to bring this session to you. It's the culmination of many, many years of pondering and challenges and struggling with the concept of assessment checklist. And it's one of those things where if you look in any TAE textbook or learner guide or any course on the topic, uh, the, including the, the regulators guides on how to develop assessment tools and those kind of things. There's lots of really well-intentioned and really good general guidelines on what to do and what we're aiming for, but very little in the way of how do we actually put together good assessment checklists. I recall an experience very, very early on. This is pre-ASQA, back when we had the, the state and territory regulators. And I developed some assessment tools for an RTO and we were being audited. And I basically had copied and pasted the performance criteria from a unit of competency and plonked it into an assessment. And I, I really remember the auditor saying, you can't do that. You can't just take the performance criteria and, and just plonk it into an assessment tool. Um, I took it to heart and I was, I was very clear on that for, for many years that you, you just don't copy paste the performance criteria. But I never really thought to dig a little deeper and go, why, why can't you do that? And sometimes, and especially as I move more into the, the space of the cert for and delivering the cert for and trading and assessment and starting to look at many, many units of competency and how they work and how they're put together. Sometimes I'd see performance criteria that no matter how many times you try and reword them, they, they're pretty good as they are. So this is basically a session that explores the concepts of assessment checklists, how we might develop them and how we might use them and also what the relationship is between the checklists that we create and use to assess our students and the original unit of competency. So I, I hope this is helpful to you. It was certainly helpful to me, like most of these sessions, putting them together is uh, you, you have some really wonderful moments where you get to, uh, I guess, consolidate understanding and knowledge. And so that, that's been really good for me as well. So hopefully it's as helpful to you as well by seeing what I've put together here. I've got the wonderful Jasmine helping me out today because this is yet again, every time we run these sessions, we just have a record number of people joining the session and uh, the chat can be a little bit out of control. And last time I was on my own and I just, I found that I, I really struggled to get to everyone's questions. So we have Jasmine and Kim's just joined us as well. So two very, very experienced and knowledgeable TAE practitioners can uh, assist you in the chat there. And also we might stop at certain points and they can field any questions to me. So I think with this number of people, it's very difficult to get to get around to everybody and answer everyone's specific question without kind of bogging down the, the flow of the session a little bit. But if you get to the end of the session and you feel like there was something that was a, a burning question didn't quite get addressed, I'd really love to hear from you. Always welcome to reach out and share your, your thoughts and any questions or anything that you didn't feel was quite covered. And we can continue that conversation after the session. But for the sake of this, I just want to keep things rolling as best we can. There will be some points in there where we can have some Q&A and some interaction as well. So today's session is a, by way of a bit of an overview. We're going to look at the benefits of well-written criteria. We're going to then look at the components of a unit of competency and which bits we might pull out to use as the basis of checklists and criteria. I've looked, I found some common non-compliances because I know that these sessions are often well attended by compliance people or people in roles where they're supporting their RTOs with their compliance. We're going to look at understanding the purpose of your assessment instrument, look, stepping back a little bit and kind of looking at what you're actually trying to do with it, 
can have a huge bearing on whether or not that checklist becomes useful or not. And there's a few surprising little things behind that. Because performance criteria from the unit are kind of the, the basis of where these things, where these checklists and criteria are built, we're going to spend some time pulling apart the performance criteria and I've prepared some worked examples for you where we've taken some performance criteria from a unit of competency, broken them up a little bit and turned them into some checklists. And then we'll look at some, some maybe some good examples and some poor examples and you can tell me your thoughts on those. So let's, let's get into the session. So I think the first thing is to look at why, why should we spend time on something like this? What are the benefits of having good assessment criteria. And one thing that will become obvious as we start going through the session, and you probably know this anyway, I know for a lot of you I'm kind of preaching to the converted already, but there can be a lot of time and thought that goes into developing good assessment checklists. And especially when we look at a unit of competency and the performance criteria and think, gee, it's already there, you know, why should I really reword this too much? Or why should I spend any time developing them further? And sometimes there can be a bit of a tension between like how much time should I invest in developing these checklists to make them useful and what's the payoff of that? And so looking at the benefits of having really well-crafted criteria can be, I think, a beneficial discussion, at least briefly. So I think first and foremost, criteria and well-written criteria become the centrepiece for pretty much everything that you do in a course from, from start to finish. So at the very beginning, they can be used to set expectations and understanding for the assessment team, especially if you've got multiple assessors working on a course. The students that are in a course, they know what they're working towards, what's expected of them. Also, you can communicate using good criteria, you can really clear, clearly communicate to managers and head teachers, you know, exactly what what's required and what the students need to do and why you might be needing them to use certain equipment or go on certain field trips or whatever it might be. It's good to talk to the employers as well. This is why we've got the students doing these things. This is why we've got the, your, your staff going through these particular activities because this is what we need to assess them against. And of course, the regulator, they want to see it as well. And there might be others. I think it also creates transparency around the assessment process. It's very, very clear. There's no room for argument about what's expected and what people need to do. Well-written criteria create defensible outcomes. Now, hopefully you don't need to defend your decision as an assessor too much, but there are circumstances where you might find yourself needing to defend the decision that you've made. And having really good criteria makes that a lot easier. Now, I think the common situations where you might be really happy to have well-written criteria that you need to defend yourself are things where you've had to tell a student that they are not yet competent or they haven't satisfactorily addressed the requirements of a task. When the cri and I've had this experience myself, is when the criteria are a little bit vague, and you've explained it to the student and they've interpreted the criteria one way and you've interpreted the criteria another way. It can be the, the source of discussion, uh, sorry, of, of, of uh, tension and, and heated conversation and people getting upset, complaints and appeals and things like that. So you, you want to try and avoid those situations and well-written criteria where there's no room for interpretation or little room for interpretation can make that a, a lot easier. And also you might need to defend your decision if there's been a, some kind of incident as well, or you know, some, perhaps you've trained or assessed someone as being competent on operating a certain piece of machinery or doing a certain task, perhaps that's led to some kind of incident or accident, and you need to be able to really clearly show that the way that you assess them meets the, the requirements really, really clearly. So that, I think that's a really good, strong argument for spending a bit of time on crafting good criteria. Overall, I think it creates fairness, reliability. So that's it's fair for the students. It's fair amongst the students. It's fair amongst the assessors. So the students aren't favoring different assessors and think, oh, well, we'll, we'll let Paul do the assessment because he's really nice and he always treats us really well and lets us pass. Whereas 
uh, Jasmine's really tough and she fails everybody. It, you know, it, it irons out those kind of situations. And it just, I think, overall breeds confidence in the assessment process. So lots of good things about spending a bit of time on our criteria. This, I think, underpins, this little discussion here, I think, underpins a lot of issues, a lot of problems that arise out of our criteria. So we might actually have really well-worded assessment criteria, but they kind of have just ended up in the wrong place. Now, firstly, I think it's worth considering whether our criteria is being used for formative assessment. So that is, we're using it not so much to, to certify or to award a result, but more as a, a, a measurement, a check to see the progress of someone in a course. So, you know, formation, formative, the formation of knowledge, the formation of skills, measuring to see progress towards an outcome. Probably most of what I'm, what I'm talking about though is the second one here is summative assessment. That's checking to see if outcomes have been achieved. So in, for most of us, I think in VET, it's about seeing whether someone is competent or not, or in the case of completing a number of tasks that together determine if a person is competent. So much of what I'm talking about is summative assessment, the, the proper one, the one that gets regulatory scrutiny and the one that leads to a piece of paper, a license, a certification, a diploma that certifies someone as being competent. And there, we talk about this a lot in our sessions, but you know what that means when someone's running around out there with a piece of paper based on decisions that you've made as an assessor that certifies them to be competent that they can work safely and effectively and do, do all the things they need to do. And that's a decision we don't want to get wrong. So it's a good argument for having good criteria. Now, these final two points here, I think are very, very important. So it, I think if there's any takeaway from today's session, if it's all you take away, this, these would be two good points to consider. So I think when we're looking at assessment criteria, you know, when we're developing checklists, especially, we typically use it to measure two different types of things. We either use it to measure the quality of performance of someone doing something. So that is observable behaviours. So if you're doing an observation assessment, you're observing someone doing something, you're looking for the, their behaviours, the way they do something, the way they perform. And so in that case, we're looking at the performance and the quality of that performance, the characteristics of that performance. And the second one is we often use checklists to measure the quality of the result of someone's performance, the result of someone doing something, and that is product characteristics. The, the product, so it doesn't have to be a physical product, but the, the result of someone having done something. And I think that... The confusion of these two things is often at the root of many, many challenges for assessors. That is, and I think the most common way that you see this is where you've got a single checklist where you have a combination of things that you need to watch someone do to be able to check off whether or not they've done it, and also things that you are really difficult to see someone doing, but you can only really see in the product or the result. So if that's still a little bit unclear, let's, let's kind of look at some examples of where you might be looking at product, the result, versus the observable behaviours of the performance. So first of all, this is, this is a unit of competency on or just a very small excerpt from a unit of competency on wood carving. And this is one, an example of performance criteria where I think it's mostly about performance. Now, of course, there might be some wood carving experts that probably have some objection to this, but in any case, I, I think mostly this is the kind of thing. If you look at the criteria here, so um, carve the wood. So if you're trying to work out whether someone can carve wood, you're probably going to need to watch them doing that. So they've got to do things like 
selecting a style and a method of wood carving that's suitable for the selected wood and the design requirements. And they need to apply and efface carving patterns on the wood to, to guide carving and optimize the use of wood. Now, someone could look at the finished product, perhaps a, a well-trained eye and an expert might, might be able to look at the final wood carving and be able to tell somehow maybe what tool they've used to arrive at that. But they didn't actually see them do it. So they're probably only guessing. So if, if they had a checklist that included things on the product, it would be very difficult to, to assess that because you're really just watching them carve. So these things here, I think, are all about the quality of performance. So the kind of thing where you'd have them in a checklist where you've got to watch the person do it. What about this one here? We've got one which is uh, from a unit on business. And you might have, here's, here's some performance kind of just sort of moving out of the way here. Can't quite see that, there we go. Determine directions for business. So this one is establishing long-term directions and goals for a business through identification, analysis of values, expectations, goals of stakeholders. And 1.2, identifying business and personal strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now that's, it's, it's kind of hard to watch someone do that, isn't it? Like to, to watch someone establish long-term directions and goals. I mean, when, when do they do it? How do you watch them? That, that's more of a cognitive process. And so to find out whether someone has effectively done that, it's probably going to be better to see the finished result, to see the, maybe a, 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 something they've created, a, a plan, a business plan or something like that. So back to what I said is when, when we have situations where checklists include both of these, or you have a checklist that's more about looking at the product of something or the qualities of a product, but you're watching a person do something, it makes it very difficult. And you might've had that experience yourself as an assessor where you're, you're watching someone perform a task and there's criteria in front of you and you, can, you kind of think, well, how, would I, how am I going to see the person do that thing? When, when would they do that? And, and it might not be until you see the finished product that you're able to, to tick that off. So some important distinctions there, I think. Have a look at these ones. You can let me know in the chat what you think these things are. Would, would these be more about performance or product? So the first one is using cleaning chemicals in accordance with workplace and manufacturer's requirements. Is that something that we'd watch them do? So performance or something that we would see the finished result of mostly? Okay, mostly performance. That's great. Thank you. Okay, let's look at the next one here. Develop plans to repair degraded land and stimulate biodiversity. But look at the keyword there, develop plans. Yep, that's a, that's a product. So we're going to want to see how good their plan is, measure the quality of their plan to see if it, they've covered those kind of things. Okay, next one. Present information to individuals and groups using presentation techniques and aids. Yep, lots of performance there. Good, good, good. Wonderful. Another one. Forklift truck is operated safely in accordance with manufacturer's requirements and safe work procedures. And we can see the performance flowing. Performance and performance, good. <laughs> That's great. Developed material is documented in accordance to workplace procedures and document design requirements. All right, you're, you've got it. So that, that's really good. I, I think you've got the point there. Really wonderful to see. Thank you for your input there. I wanted to, because of the compliance focus of a lot of these sessions, and, and I know there's, you know, compliance is a big part of being, of being even a trainer and assessor, even if you're not the compliance manager or the compliance professional, we are all in a role where, where we've got to do things that meet the requirements of regulations and standards. And we need to all do things in ways that help our training provider you know, tick the boxes at, at our audit and performance assessments and to address quality. So I, there's a consultant, Joe Newbery. He's really awesome. He puts out a lot of really great content. And um, he summarized on his blog, I've got a link to that there. And all, again, all the links and resources that we mentioned in this session 
we'll all, we always release them at the end in the follow-up email. So if you, you know, if you want to check that out, we'll have the link to that. But he, he basically summarizes that common non-compliances regarding you know, developing assessment tools are that it doesn't address all the performance criteria. So that's a, if you're thinking about the, the principles of assessment, it's an issue with validity. Doesn't address all performance evidence, again, validity. And the criteria in observation checklists do not describe observable behaviors. So that's validity and reliability. And insufficient benchmarking to support the reliability of the observation. So that is when you look at the, the completed checklist that the assessors filled out, it's not actually clear what, what actually happened in that assessment. How do we know that that student really is competent or not? And the other one is observation criteria not aligning to the task requirements validity. So hopefully that's good to, to, to look at, to acknowledge that that's some really common issues with assessment checklists and applying some of these principles, we might be able to head in the right direction where we can avoid some of these pitfalls. So I think a few of them there, things like, you know, not addressing all performance criteria and performance evidence, we, we can, we can fix that pretty easily with mapping and just well-designed tools that have adequate coverage. But I think these other things really come down to how well we write up our instructions, how well we write the procedures and the processes for administering the assessment, and how well we write up the actual checklists themselves. One thing that I've really found myself struggling with over the years, and even up until recently, you know, we've been knee deep over the last couple of months in developing the new TAE assessments. And for most of you in the know, the new TAE has been pretty much a rewrite of a lot of units, even though there's kind of superseded versions, they're just so differently worded that you can't just go back and rejig the old checklist. It's pretty much just a rewrite of those things. So we've been doing a lot of this stuff lately. And especially in highly complex units like what are in the TAE, I, I find myself getting really struggling, you know, trying to capture everything. And I really like this. I, I found this document floating around. It's it more of a, I think, in the context of higher education, but it's a really good point from Dr. Claire Hughes. And I'll include a link to that document it's called Quick Bite Practical Guidelines for Writing Assessment Criteria and Standards from the University of Queensland. And a couple of little anecdotes from, from this handout was that assessment checklists can rarely carry all the detail of the explicit and implicit, implicit understandings and skills. So if you've got like a really, yeah, especially when you're, we're looking at courses like Cert 4s and diploma level, if you're involved in those, it's very difficult once you start thinking about it, and you're an industry professional and you know all the different bits and pieces of knowledge and skills that are you know, implied, you know, the things that they need to know and be able to do before they even start doing that competency is very vast. And it's very easy to get carried away in over describing the unit. And you can see this, this statement here from Dr. Claire Hughes, which says, attempting to achieve levels of precision that remove all subjectivity from assessment judgments of complex learning will result in documents made unwieldy and therefore unfit for purpose through their length and obtuseness. And I think that's a really good point, a really good reminder because I've found myself in these, and we we're having a little meeting this morning where I, I was showing off a, a, an assessment checklist that we developed for one of the, the new TAE assignments and, and it's really long. And I know from my experience using very, very long assessment checklists in the past, they, they can become quite burdensome, not just for the assessor, because there's lots of things to check off, things to mark off, but also for the student in understanding what's expected of them in the task when there's so many there. So it, it, it is a bit of a balancing act. And sometimes there might be points in developing an assignment or a project or a task where you think, maybe it's time to split these up. You know, is there, is there an activity where I can assess these other things somewhere else doing another particular task? So we've got to be, be, be realistic. And this one was kind of a bit of a it hit home a little bit as well, this, this concept of 
attempting to remove all subjectivity. And that's what we try and teach. You know, that if you, I think shortly we'll have a look at an, an anecdote from the ASQA guidelines and they, they really say, you know, remove subjectivity from it. And I know in, you know, when we were doing all the upgrades from the, the 40110 to the 40116 Cert 4, you all probably know the develop assessment tools unit was a big one. So all the trainers and assessors in Australia had to learn how to develop assessment tools. And we're often grappling with that concept because we're, we're saying, hey, you've got to remove subjectivity. You've got to remove that, um, you know, remove the wording and the criteria that make it open for interpretation. And sometimes we really got ourselves, and helping students, we got ourselves really tied up in knots trying to, take all of the subjectivity out of it and make it so that it was something that there was absolutely no room for misinterpretation. For some of the simpler units, that's not too difficult, but when you get to the more complex, you know, sort of units that you might find in diplomas, that gets really challenging. So I think for anyone working on the, hot, the units that are sitting in higher level qualifications that, are, that are, describe more complex tasks, you know, maybe you can let yourself off the hook just a little bit in knowing that it's probably going to be very, very difficult to remove all the subjectivity. And you might get to the point where you've developed a, a checklist that, that's so long and so complex that it might actually lose its fitness for purpose anyway. So some quick revision for you. This is now we're gonna move into the realms of pulling apart the unit of competency and developing criteria. So if you could just pop a few thoughts in the chat on this, we've got what part of the unit tells us what the student must know? So in a unit of competency, what part of the unit says what they must know? Enrique, yes, one of our graduates, you know what you're talking about, the knowledge evidence, well done. <laughs> well done. So the knowledge evidence and that sitting down at the bottom, you know, often we, we lose it. The newer assessors forget that there's that second part of the unit of competency that describe the knowledge evidence. Excellent. Yes, Kate, and commonly, commonly uh, abbreviated to KE. Very good. What part of the unit tells us what the student must be able to do? Interesting. Yes. Okay, so... Okay, yeah, performance criteria. Thank you, Hannah. So it is it is performance criteria. The performance criteria describe what they must be able to do. Certainly, though, the performance evidence, so you weren't wrong, the performance evidence tell us the, I guess, the conditions around what they must be able to do. So, you know, the performance criteria will describe the process of them doing it, but the performance evidence say, hey, they need to do it three times, and they need to create this product. Uh, the assessor needs to observe them doing this thing four times. So it's a, it is the interplay between both the performance evidence and performance criteria. What part of the unit might tell us whether the assessment should be carried out in a workplace? Yep, assessment conditions, excellent. I can see we're surrounded by uh, training and assessment professionals here. That's great. And finally, what part of the unit tells us the outcome? The outcome. This one's a bit of a, a hidden one, but if you look in any, almost any unit of condition, it, uh, sorry, any, any unit of competency, you'll actually see a little, little hidden clue there somewhere. So let's have a look at it. Uh, I'll just jump forward here. So if you look in a unit of competency, they always say this performance criteria describe the performance needed to demonstrate achievement of the element. So what's the element? Elements describe the essential outcomes. So it's elements that describe the essential outcome. I probably would have struggled to answer that as well. I, I mean, that's, I'm just chucking that in there just for a bit of fun. So I'll just jump back here. That's good. Well, so I, I think you all passed that test, the, the quick TAE revision test. Well done. Very good. Here's some excerpts from ASQA's uh, guide to assessment tools. So every few years, the regulator releases a, 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 I guess, a guideline on what they expect for the guidance of assessment tools. 
They, this one's pretty good. The latest version, I think it was released in 2021 from ASQA, freely available on the website. We'll send you the link. They uh, are pretty good. It's got some good examples in there. But again, yeah, some little bits of vagueness and things that you might kind of interpret in different ways. But fair enough, because units of competency, as you start to look at all the, the different ones that are out there, there's a whole lot of different units and they're, they're very different. So it's, it's probably very hard for the regulator to release a one-size-fits-all specification of how we should all design our assessment tools. So it's pretty good, though. There's some good stuff in there. But the one thing that really stood out, have a look at these anecdotes here from... So these little excerpts from the, the guide to assessment tool from ASQA. So they say in there things like criteria used to judge the quality of performance, also referred to as the assessment decision-making rules, the rules that are used to make judgments about whether competency has been achieved, uh, the, the rules used by assessors to ensure consistent outcomes when checking evidence quality. Okay, here's that one that we mentioned before. Should not be open for interpretation. Must provide sufficient clarity for assessment judgments to be consistent across a range of assessors and points in time. So one thing that I noticed throughout the, the guides to assessment tools, they really harp on about this term judgment. And I've seen it in a few different audit reports as well, where the, the report says things like, you know, the assessment tools cited at audit were insufficient to, to see that the assessors were able to make judgments about whether competency has been achieved. And so I, I just thought, wouldn't it be good? Maybe we should define this word judgment. And what does it actually mean? So I went and looked at the dictionary definition. So judgment is the ability to make considered decisions or come to sensible conclusions. So looking at that running theme of judgment, which is what we, so we're creating instruments, we're creating checklists and instruments and things that we can give to our assessors that give them the ability to be able to make considered decisions and come to sensible conclusions. So that's what we need to make sure our criteria will let that happen. Our criteria will allow them to make considered decisions and come to sensible conclusions. So let's dig in a bit more now. So we know that probably most of us are going to be pulling apart the performance criteria as a basis for creating assessment checklists. So it might be, it might be nice to look at a few examples and see how we might actually do that. How can we pull them apart? And also to answer that question of, you know, why, why can't I just copy and paste the performance criteria and just chuck that in an assessment tool? Maybe there's some situations, as you discover, there might be some situations where you can do that. Uh, it needs to be a considered copy and paste. It can't just be a, a throw it in there and hope for the best. You need to know what you're actually putting in there. In most cases, though, I don't, I just don't think it's really possible because what you'll see is embedded in these criteria, you'll see parts of them deal with knowledge. So things that you might need to ask students about. Parts of them deal with performance, things that you'd actually need to watch the student do to find out whether they can do it or not. And things that cover products, like we talked about before. So you want to see what they've created to make sure that they've actually done that. Uh, I've had this slide up before, but basically performance criteria describe the performance, need to demonstrate achievement of the element. What is the element? It is the essential outcome. And for most units, using the performance criteria wording, wording verbatim will paint with two broad brush strokes to enable a fair and reliable assessment. It leaves too much open for interpretation. So despite the... I guess, reassuring guidance earlier that said, hey, we probably won't get it perfect. We still need to do our best to make sure that it is fair and reliable to take too much of that room for interpretation out. So just using performance criteria will probably paint with two broader brushstrokes. So let's, let's look at our first example here, which is from a unit manage audio operations for outdoor events. A lot of these examples, I, I don't really have much experience with. This one I do in a former life, I used to do this kind of stuff. 
um, determine audio requirements for outdoor event in, a, in consultation with required personnel and with reference to production requirements and documentation. So I think by now, most of us could look at that one single performance criteria and know that if we were to put that into an assessment checklist and give that to an assessor and say, hey, go and watch someone and, and tick the box, it's, it's going to be really difficult because there's, there's so many bits in that. There's so many bits and moving parts that kind of have interplay with each other that just having kind of one box to tick might be really challenging. So let's break down what's in it. And you'll need to, when you do this for your own assessments, you'll need to go through this process of picking apart from your highly experienced industry professional's perspective, pick them apart and kind of do a bit of an analysis on them. So here, when I pick this apart, there's a few different things. So firstly, they need to, to, to actually do this thing, to perform this thing, they need to consult with personnel that's the bit in kind of a yellowy orange color. They need to be able to refer to production requirements and documentation. So there's a bit of kind of reading and analysis there. And once they've done those things, as a result of having talked to people and read the production requirements, then they'll be able to determine what equipment they need, the, the audio requirements. So there's kind of three different things happening there. When you, if you get a little bit caught up with this, you might need to ask yourself, so th these, these are things for you, for you as the, the developer, questions that might help you unpack it a bit further and figure out how you might assess them. So consult with personnel. So which personnel do they need to talk to? How do they consult? What questions would they need to ask? The next part is production requirements and documentation. So where would they find the production requirements? Is that something that they need to get from the personnel? So when they've consulted with the personnel, they might give them the production requirements. And what does those, what does that documentation tell them about the audio they need to get? And then finally, determine audio requirements. So what, what will tell us they've successfully determined these audio requirements? And so as a result of having asked those questions and broken them down, that, that 1.1, that one single performance criteria might be split out into four different items in a checklist. So confirmed venue size, noise restrictions, and performer requirements with event, with event organizer. So that's a consultation thing. Obtained correct venue layout and diagrams. Prepared production plan and packing list. Selected production, production equipment is consistent with the requirements. So that's just an example. This is not perfect, and I certainly haven't worked in this industry for a while, but this is an example of how one performance criteria might end up being split out into multiple aspects. Let's look at another example. So this one here is, I think, is an example of where you could almost use the wording straight from the performance criteria. So this is on concrete pump delivery operations. Again, something that this one, I don't have any practical experience with, but the wording from the performance criteria, just a couple of examples here. So they, they didn't all fit in this mold, but 2.4, clean and service hoppers prior to use in accordance with workplace requirements. And 4.5, test, test run pumping systems and prepare for use in accordance with manufacturer requirements. So I think these things, you know, it'd be, you'd be really hard pressed to reword them too much. You probably get a little bit carried away with it, but you could probably use the wording. Uh, you might split out perhaps, you know, test run pumping systems as one and prepare for use in accordance with manufacturer requirements as another. So knowing your industry, knowing how these competencies are used on the job will, will probably help you a lot more here. Here's another one where, you know, it could go either way. So design and produce spreadsheets. So one of the performance criteria there was design spreadsheet, the wording here is funny, design spreadsheet design to suit purpose, audience and information requirements of the task. And so you, you might be able to get away with something like that, where you pretty much use the same wording that says, you know, did the candidate design the spreadsheet design to suit the purpose, audience, and information requirements of the task, yes or no? You'd probably get away with that. Well, I think 
going a bit further might be a good idea here. So you could split them out and have a, so remember we're looking here at the, the product rather than the performance. I think it would be pretty dull to sit there for an hour and a half watching someone design a spreadsheet and ticking these boxes. So you probably want to you know, certainly make sure they've done it. Remember authenticity, one of the principles of assessment, uh, sorry, rules of evidence. Um, but uh, you're probably more interested in what they've actually created. So you'd have a, a checklist that confirms the quality of the product here. Does the candidate spreadsheet, uh, does the design suit the purpose? Yes or no. Uh, does it meet audience requirements? Does it address the work specification? Now, interestingly, there's a bit of room for interpretation here. So I'd say that you would want to have something in the instructions that helps define the purpose, the audience requirements, and the work specification. So depending on how you're using this, if you were doing this as a sort of more of a case study thing, you might actually have a project brief that describes the purpose and audience requirements and the specifications. But if it was a workplace present, uh, workplace uh, observation, then you know you might need to go and refer to what task the employer gave the student to give that a bit more, uh, a bit more specificness around it. So that that would be important. I think sometimes we can make the assessments more specific by being very clear in our task instructions. So here's another example, sell to the retail customer. So the performance criteria says use questioning and active listening to facilitate effective two-way communication. And so you might go, all right, well, we could probably just copy and paste that, use questioning and active listening to facilitate two-way communication. Did the candidate do it? Yes or no, that might work. But if you unpack it further, you can really arrive at a lot more of a, a much more specific checklist. So it might look like this. So we have here the result. The result is we want two-way communication and that the fact that it was facilitated, but what are the qualities of effective two-way communication? And if we unpack the unit, we can see that questioning and active listening are the things that are needed to, that the student needs to do. Uh, and that qualifies what effective two-way communication is in the context of this unit. So having a checklist kind of set up like this Two-way communication was facilitated using questioning. So did they use questioning? Yes. Did they use active listening? Yes. So that's an example of a performance. It'd be very hard to, to see that after the fact, you know, by looking, there's probably no way you could really assess that other than watching the, the student actually do the thing and watching it live and, you know, checking the box once you've observed them do that thing. Uh, some now I'm just going to finish up with some ad, uh, some general tips and guidance for you, and then we'll have a little bit of a a quiz, I guess, or something. Get you get your feedback on certain things. So adverbs and objectives can be can introduce a lot of issues with that subjectivity. So we've got to use them with care. So look at these examples here. Surface is washed effectively. Candidate did well when operating the chainsaw. Area for painting is prepared thoroughly. Maneuver is performed very quickly. So what do you think? But maybe just a couple of comments in the chat. What are some issues with, with these criteria here? Very subjective, yeah. The terms are too broad, very general, not detailed sufficiently. There's no time bound there, yes. Not measurable, not quantitative. Yep, excellent. Very good. Yeah, fantastic. So these these adverbs and adjectives that you know just, just sort of add something to a verb, you know, d d add more, um, describe things. They add color. Really good in creative writing, but when it comes to doing uh, doing criteria, they can be very challenging. So we've got to be careful with these kind of things. So what I'm gonna do now is give you uh, four examples and you can tell me whether these are good or poor. And I say good, like they're not excellent, but they, you know, are, they, are they good or are they a poor example of a criteria? So here's the first one. Adjust stem fasteners to five nanometers using a torque wrench. 
Okay, all right, good. Most, most people think that's a, a pretty good example. It's uh, precise. It's referring specifically to what they need to adjust. It's given a, a measurable benchmark, five nanometers, and it's described the, the tool that needs to be used. Okay, Sandy said, what about the time taken? Yes, maybe, maybe there needs to be a time frame added to it. Good point. What about this one? I, I think you'll see I'm being maybe a little bit obvious with these ones, but see how you go. Prepare baked goods to be ready for customers using a range of techniques and tools correctly and efficiently in a way that reflects a real life commercial baking setting using ingredients on hand. Okay, I think... <laughs> I have seen I have seen these though you know it's we're probably having a little bit of a chuckle at this one but I have seen and sometimes when if you look at the the wording of certain performance criteria they're not too different to this they they're kind of worded in this way and that's I think that really tells us the the problem with using performance criteria verbatim so I think we all agree that's a poor example what about this one this is short and sweet dig hole to correct depth Yeah, I think it's poor. What is the correct depth? Yep, exactly. What depth, Chloe? I agree. What what equipment is this? A, is this a using an excavator, a big machine, or a shovel? Are we planting a tree? Are we installing a septic tank? So I think I think we need a lot more information on this. Sometimes you can have criteria like this where the instructions in the assessment actually provide the necessary um, measurements for these things, you know, just define what the correct depth is and what tools need to be used. Uh, but certainly in isol isolation by itself, this is, this is not necessarily a good, good one. Okay, and here's one, conduct pre-start checks of excavator in accordance with the standard operating procedures. Okay, it's 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 okay. I, I think you know this. You'd probably see something like this. I think this is pretty common, and and as Melanie points out, yes, as long as the standard operating procedures are provided, so that there's actually a a, a specific guidance on what those pre uh, pre start checks are. So it's it's probably okay as long as there's you know supporting documentation with it. So let's let's finish up. Uh, with some general principles and I guess some general learnings from this, this whole thing is I think we can all agree that the more specific and measurable we make our criteria, the better. Uh, we need to, before we embark on the development process, we need to consider the difference between assessing performance, assessing the qualities of a product and performance, and of course, assessing knowledge, which is probably a separate conversation. And uh, just a little reminder, if you're curious about ways to assess knowledge, we'll explore that in the next webinar, which is about uh, wording of questions, which is a whole art and science in itself. So that's a different discussion. And we need to take the time in pretty much most cases, with some exceptions, to break up the performance criteria into those measurable components. And I think based on the, the your input, and your discussions as part of in the, in the chat here, I think we really know the importance of not just having a good checklist, but the supporting documentation that goes with it, the instructions to the candidates, the resources we give them, the parameters and guidelines that might be separate to the checklist. They might not actually be part of the thing that we tick the boxes for, but they still form a very, very important part in making it measurable, making it specific. So we have a little bit of time. Uh, if you have any tips, then I would love to hear them. So we're going to finish the official session here and I'll open it up to the chat box here. And if you have any thoughts and tips on what you've found to be helpful, then please add them. And maybe Jasmine, did you pick up on anything throughout the session that stands out, uh, some, some input that I might have missed? Because I saw the chat box going absolutely wild there for a while. Uh, there was a couple of great questions from Enrique, uh, which we we partially answered in a way, but not directly. 
Uh, and there was also one just popped up, but it's disappeared so quickly because everyone's um, really contributing. So thanks everyone for getting involved. Uh, so just to answer one that came up in the webinar chat just a moment ago in regards to tick and flick criteria, um, can we not just generate the checklist with the explicit uh, criteria to tick, tick and flick it? Uh, I think we just really want to avoid that, that term altogether. Uh, it's not really best practice. Um, and it can probably be avoided, as Paul mentioned, through having a good assessor guide rather than having a big, long, extra drawn out checklist to feel like we need to tick and flick. Um, just mm -hmm. having that really good assessor guidance around the criteria can, can sort of mediate that and prevent us having to, to go down that pathway. Yeah, that's a great point. In, in in my research for this session, I just wanted to look around out there and see what kind of assessment um, criteria are in use and how people are putting together their assessment tools. And there was a lot of, uh, to I guess, to move away from tick and flick and to, uh, to I guess, nod to the ASQA check, uh, sorry, the ASQA, God, I'm losing my words now. The, the ASQA guidelines, that, that document that I referred to earlier, which we'll send you a link to, the um, fact sheet, that's what it is. They talk about using judgment. And so to help with that, we're, I'm seeing a lot of these assessment things that rather than having the tick boxes, they list the criteria and then have a column on the, the right-hand side or you know whatever side really next to the criteria where the assessors actually make comments on what they observed. So whether they were looking at the product and evaluating that quality of the product or they were watching a person do something. So their little comments along the side, you know, kind of say, you know, I watched the person uh, do their presentation this way or they, you know, they almost sort of use their little feedback comments there or perhaps consider this or consider that. And that way when the record actually shows that, yes, by ticking the box at the bottom that says, yes, they did all these things, the assessor actually used their judgment. They were considering what was happening rather than just going tick, 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 and tick in the box. And uh, yes, there's, I noticed there was a few comments there about the recording. Absolutely, we'll put the recording up. And if you haven't already subscribed to our newsletter, I'll just uh, pop a link to that in the chat. Uh, so the newsletter, which we, set, we usually send out fortnightly, it will we'll include the recording there and we put it up on our website. So you'll absolutely get the, get the recording whether you came or not. So if you have any colleagues that missed out, you can share it with them. And we also put all of the links and resources and anything else, the slide deck and all that stuff with it. Uh, anyone who attended will get a certificate of attendance. Absolutely. We generate the certificates of attendance from the, the logs of Zoom. So we know who is actually here for you know, most of the session. If you left a little bit early, that's okay. Uh, and you know, came in a little bit late. That's not an issue. But we try and look for people that you know participated in most of the session. If you did participate and you didn't get your certificate, please reach out. We'd love to make sure that you're recognised. I really appreciate your time that you've spent with us today. I know these sessions are free in terms of money, but they're not free in terms of the time that you take out of your day. So I want to acknowledge you for your effort and your attention and your participation. I really enjoy these sessions. I know Jasmine and Kim enjoy the sessions they run as well. So thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful day and look forward to seeing you in the next session, which again is on developing assessment questions.